Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Good afternoon everyone, this is Sage and welcome to the Executive Corner. In today's expert talk, we have with us Mr. Justin Westernedge, the founder of Vloggy. And in today's show, we will share the insights about creating an innovative video production platform which combines smart video uploads with cloud-based cloud automation that allows businesses to manipulate and license its own content. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under the one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock markets and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome, Justin. It's a pleasure to e meet you. Thank you. And uh, wonderful, wonderful to be here. Excellent. So you are the founder of Vloggy. And Vloggy's vision is to democratize video production for businesses. How inspiring. Would you please shed some light on Vloggy's focus on helping businesses create video content and execute brand advocacy content? Yeah, exactly. So, look, ultimately, um, the problem that we face in video, um, as you know, um, is that we need about 500 times the amount of video that we have today in a decade's time. And when you have multiple devices and when you start to have um, foldable screens and so forth, we're just going to need a lot of lot more video, which is hyper personal, very niche, um, and, and very local. And really, video production, even in its cheapest form today, won't even um, allow that. So instead, we actually came up with uh, about two years ago. We came up with a with, with a product that and that that turns all of your community and all of your, your customers into filmmakers, right? So we have a tool that makes it very easy for anybody to upload their footage from their phone and very easy for organizations to actually turn those clips into meaningful video programs. Fantastic. And we just got a little primer there about how your platform works. So how does your platform help businesses in reducing the cost of video production? Look, essentially twofold. Um, first of all, we outsource essentially the the filming to members of the public. So these are an organization's customers or their community members or even their, their colleagues actually use their phone to, to film footage in the first place. And then we have an AI-driven smart um, video production tool that automates the production of those videos to, to certain rules. So. For a one-off video, we may or may not be um, suitable. Really what we are is about mass automation of video. So imagine that any brand can, can turn on a tap to get, to get video reviews. Um, for example, an average uh, e-commerce brand would probably be able to get about 100. We have some clients on our, on our system getting two or 300 video clips submitted by their customers every, every month. And these are turned into either video reviews or compiled into thematic uh, videos. Okay, sounds very, very interesting. So in your opinion, what are the benefits of replacing influencer content with user-generated videos? Look, all content marketers out there know that uh, influencer marketing is incredibly valuable because you can get um, what appears to be a genuine, authentic customer um, footage in your marketing mix. But at the same time, influence is actually very expensive um, with posts upwards of $1,000, probably more like $20,000.
it's very perfect and very inauthentic. And instead, what we allow you to do is, is combine many of the real customers' videos into uh, templated videos that actually look uh, more authentic. And really, the, the reason why people do this as one of the brands of their marketing mix is because user-generated video is trusted about seven times more than uh, paid creative, but also is a lot, lot cheaper. We always say that um, we offer a quick ABC, authenticity, breadth, and cost. And this is why people would use um, com community video rather than, or, or as well as influencer video. Fantastic. Well, talking to you is really bringing a lot of questions to mind. And it sounds like it's going to really help businesses with that authenticity and, and showing what's really going on behind the scenes to their potential consumers. So how can businesses turn on their user-generated content or UGC video tap, please? Look, essentially, um, if you have an active community, and by that, if you're a brand that has a net promoter score above about eight, or you have a, a reach in your in your EDM of of several thousand or more, then you already have a user base of potential videographers. Because with any, what we know from our, we've been doing this for a couple of years. We know that most brands have a uh, uptake rate of about two or three percent. You send out a campaign and you'll get two or three percent back. But what you find is it actually grows over time. So it's a very much a network effect. So the first time you run a campaign, you may have to push a lot of levers. Um, I mean, ours is a very simple upload link, but even getting that out through your communication channels may take a bit of work. But then what you, what you find is that once you get your first few entries in and then you publish those back onto Facebook or onto your social media, that encourages more, and then you get about 4%, and then by the time uh, we have some clients now who get about 6 or 7% um, uptake from their really passionate brand advocates every time they push out a new campaign, and, then, and they're getting hundreds of, of video submissions. Wow. So sounds like it's quite an easy process once you get started. Uh, Please talk more about the expected raising of 1.5 to 2 million US dollars seed of capital, please. Um, yeah, so look, um, essentially we have, uh, we've created a platform that uh, is about a thousand times cheaper uh, than traditional video production, about a hundred times quicker. We've spent a long time building that um, and now uh, and we've, we've got all our marketing in, in place and we know our targets and stuff. But we're raising one and a half million dollars now to to commercialise that. So a lot of that money goes into into marketing, about six hundred sixty thousand, uh, and then some refinements around the product still, um, and also just in that video design. Um, so yeah, so we're looking for one and a half million dollars in, in seed round, and um, to really get us to the next stage. Um, we think that in about a year's time, we should have um, we should have around a thousand customers bringing. Um, about a hundred thousand contributors making about uh, nine or ten nine hundred hours of, of video without platform, and this is just the start. Our ultimate goal, really, is to really own the community video space. And what I mean by that is, we think every Facebook group will ultimately have its own te television channel, and um, using technology like ours to to easily gather clips and then and then produce them together, sequence them together into professional videos. Fantastic. Well, I'm very excited to hear about this innovation. I'm sure it's going to take a lot of frustration out of marketing for many businesses and using stock videos that don't always sell your story as well as you possibly could yourself. That was a fabulous show, Justin. We have to wind up there. Was there anything you'd like to add uh, before we close off? Um, not really, but uh, look, I'm pretty easy to, to contact. If you Google my name or the name of the business, um, you can find me if, uh, if anybody out there uh, would like to invest in the future of video. Fantastic. Thanks again for your time, Justin. And this is Sage. If you're just joining us for the Expert Talks, we just had Justin Westenedge, the founder of Vloggy. And you can watch the full video at our YouTube channel, Calkine Media. And I'll sign off for day, today, but watch this space for more. Until then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. 
whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal, what's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Our social environment affects our happiness. Hi, this is Andy from Calkine Media and you are watching Calkine Wellness. Please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to get the notifications for our latest videos. How happy are we and what measures our happiness and well-being? Well, according to the World Happiness Report 2020, the quality of the social environment decides our happiness or well-being. This report is a significant survey measuring the global happiness of 156 participant countries. In 2011, the UN got inspired by Bhutan, whose fourth king first coined the term gross national happiness in 1972. After 2011, governments across the world decided to give more importance to happiness and well-being to determine social and economic progress. The 2020 report, which is the eighth such report, explores in detail how social environment affects happiness. For example, Individuals who have higher levels of interpersonal and institutional trust do significantly better than others in many adverse situations like ill health, family breakdown, unemployment, low incomes and even discrimination. The average national happiness is measured by six key variables, GDP per capita, generosity, social support, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make the choices and freedom from corruption. The study is divided into two parts. First, the national average evaluation is affected by inequality, mainly inequality of well-being. Second, it was found for the first time that a more supportive social environment increases the life evaluation, directly or indirectly, and delivers good gains to those in misery. So, what leads to positivity? According to this report, freedom and generosity have a higher impact on the positive aspects. Moreover, the absence of corruption, social support and freedom significantly reduce the negative effects. It has also been found that sustained positive emotions are essential for a good life. The most important feature is that positive emotions matter more than the absence of negative emotions when measuring longevity or resistance to cold. Finland maintained the top spot for being the world's happiest country. Its happiness score has increased and is significantly ahead of other countries. Denmark also increased its average happiness quotient and held the second position. Switzerland, recording a higher happiness score, jumped to the third spot from sixth in the previous year. Iceland, Norway and the Netherlands are fourth, fifth and sixth respectively. Thus, the top 20 ranks are almost identical as the previous year, with a few changes and interestingly, life evaluations in the top 10 countries are more than twice those in countries than that are at the bottom 10. Another fascinating factor is countries with smaller populations tend to be happier. For instance, the living evaluation of people in South Asia is far below their counterparts in Europe. Fancy that. Increased population in fact hurts well-being. Worry, anger and sadness give rise to an increase in adverse impact. So, the 10 countries that suffered the most adverse negative life evaluation experienced a combination of political, social and economic stress. It is seen that a robust social environment lowers happiness loss, while its absence can be devastating during a negative situation. 
Now, if you like all this kind of information, please like, share and comment on the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel and press that bell icon to get the notifications for our latest video updates. For regular updates and information in general, log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. This is Andy Liu from Calkine Wellness. I'm Rachel Jones and you're watching Calkine Media. In late 2013, Dogecoin was created by Jackson Palmer and Billy Marcus, pretty much as a joke. The logo of the cryptocurrency is a meme that was popular at the time, and Doge was deliberately misspelled by the developers that indicate the Shiba Inu dog. The development of Dogecoin was to poke fun at Bitcoins and for gaining public attention. Publicity stunts were done by a group of enthusiasts such as sponsoring a NASCAR drive. But the coin isn't a joke anymore. The currency's value increased by more than thousandfold in 2021. The main reason behind the boost in value is CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, tweeted in favor of Dogecoin. So let's find out a little more about this digital currency. In comparison to Bitcoin, Dogecoin offers some advantages. Firstly, it's easier to acquire. With Dogecoin, it's easier for the miners to solve the mathematical equations that are required for completing the transactions and recording the transactions. Next, there's no lifetime cap in Dogecoin. This means there's no limit on the mining and creation of Dogecoin. But in the case of Bitcoin, a lifetime cap of 21 million exists. As a result, the miners must put in a lot of effort to mine Bitcoins. So how does it work? Well, like Bitcoins and Ethereum, Dogecoin runs on a blockchain. Blockchain technology is a distributed ledger and a decentralized platform that maintains a record of all the transactions. The transaction once entered into the blockchain cannot be changed or tempered as it uses cryptography therefore extends a high level of security. In the Dogecoin blockchain, the cryptocurrency holders get an identical copy of the ledger. With any new transaction in the Dogecoins, the ledger is updated. Dogecoins can be purchased from the crypto exchanges such as Kraken or Binance. For entering into the purchase and exchange of cryptocurrencies, the user is required to undergo the setup account that needs to be created with cryptocurrency or US dollars. Therefore, Dogecoin cryptocurrency can be used for the purpose of purchases and payments, but the value stored in Dogecoin is not effective, which is why there's no lifetime cap on the mining of Dogecoins. By design, the Dogecoins are highly inflationary. The supply of Dogecoins is extensive, Miners are rewarded with millions of Dogecoins on every mining. So that's Dogecoin in a nutshell. If you like this video, please like, share and comment on it. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel Jones, signing off for Calkine Media. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine.
Bitcoin, we're four out now. The shiniest of all cryptocurrencies has lost some of its luster over the past four weeks, and in this video, I'll take you through why that is. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Bitcoin briefly nudged its way past the 50k US barrier earlier this week before dropping once again below that point. It's now priced at around $48,000. The drop back below 50 shows that Bitcoin has yet to fully recover from a slump that began after it hit a new all-time high in November. Putting aside the fact that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general is inherently a volatile asset class, the question remains. Why has Bitcoin slumped in the past four weeks after such an epic climb to the top throughout September and October? The Breakdown of Bitcoin's Journey The past four weeks has been a dramatic drop for the world's number one crypto. In the context of 2021, however, it's merely another twist in a year that's had more twists and turns than a corkscrew at a Hunter Valley winery. To look at a price graph of Bitcoin, it doesn't look dissimilar to someone climbing to the top of Everest, spending two seconds at the peak, and then descending down the other side. Kind of like Homer Simpson riding a frozen corpse down the murder horn. Now that short-lived peak, incidentally, was Bitcoin's all-time high of $68,500 US dollars on November 11. At that point, there was a feeling amongst the Bitcoin bulls that the ascent might well continue on to 100,000 US. And yet, from there, Bitcoin has descended to under 50,000, with a couple of free falls thrown in for good measure. This, of course, leads us to ask in our best Tommy Wiseau impression, Bitcoin, why are you tearing me apart? For those of us Bitcoin owners with enough of a functioning nervous system left, Following a year of more ups and downs than a Pitt Street elevator, we're left asking the question, why? Why, for the love of God, why won't Bitcoin just stay steady? As it turns out, amidst all the mayhem, there are some reasons why Bitcoin is indeed dropping. Firstly, there's uncertainty surrounding regulations. Bitcoin's decline over the past four weeks were immediately preceded by fresh comments from SEC Chairman Gary Gensler surrounding regulation. Some, including executives from Coinbase Global and FTX Group, two of the world's largest crypto exchanges, have suggested that Bitcoin's recent drop is a direct result of a war of jurisdiction between different regulatory bodies. Yeah, that old happy little chestnut. Biden's infrastructure bill. In addition to wondering where he is and screaming at the damn kids to get off the damn sidewalk, US President Joe Biden has also managed to come up with some legislation. Yes, he was able to do that. In November, Biden signed a US $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, which included some new legislation surrounding crypto. The passing of the bill meant that crypto exchanges are now required to notify the IRS of any crypto transactions. This in turn makes it more difficult for investors to hide any capital gains which they might have previously obtained from cryptos such as Bitcoin. Omicron Concerns The other big variable is the new Omicron strain of the coronavirus, which has been loose in the US since late November. Now it's certainly made traditional traders nervous and that has also pushed over into the crypto space leading to mass sell-offs. On November 26, the US stock market took a clouting as the Dow Jones dropped around 2.5%, while the S&P 500 and Nasdaq markets fell around 2.2%. Although traditionally the crypto space remains largely unaffected by the ebbs and flow of the stock market, this still might well have contributed to Bitcoin's most recent fall from grace. So with all that said, here's the verdict. Anyone who has spent considerable time studying Bitcoin should know by now that the past four weeks is par for the course when it comes to volatility in the crypto space. Despite Bitcoin's recent decline, the year-to-date returns of Bitcoin still sit at around 80%, which far outweighs that of property, shares, or even gold. So let's have a little bit of perspective. Bitcoin still remains solid in a year that seems anything but. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then please make sure to like, share, subscribe to the channel, drop us a comment about what other crypto related info you'd like us to take a look at, and of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. For more information, just head across to the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine.
Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks Executive Corner by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. John Pastor, the General Manager of 24 Hours in Sydney. And today's adventure specialist will share insights from the tourism sector. And 24 Hours in Sydney have a very inspiring motto, you've got to love Sydney. And they can give you plenty of reasons to do so with their unique walks and tour offerings. So where the guide actually becomes your best friend. And bringing you live today on the show, we have Mr. John Pastor, the General Manager of 24 Hours in Sydney. Welcome to the show, John. Welcome. How are you today? <laughs> thank you so much. I'm well, thank you. And thanks for fitting us in your busy schedule. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I just love Sydney. Yes, and I can feel your passion through the screen already. <laughs> well, it's a great day to connect with you because the government's announced they're going to have a stay and rediscover $50 voucher for everyone to spend on tourism and aviation. Yeah, so, it, it's, it's an extension of the Dine and Discover card. It's something that we've embraced the last 24 hours in Sydney. Uh, you can use it on 10 different offerings of what we've got the tours in Sydney. We cover small bars, we cover the rock, we cover um, Manly, uh, all the great places of Sydney that people working who have been living here for over 30 years or more, we find them places that they don't realise we actually exist. Fantastic. Well, look, John, let's make the most of our time together today. Your business sounds like a very exciting venture. Do you mind telling us the ins and outs? When did you start operating and what was the inspiration behind the brand, please? Well, funnily enough, it was it goes back a long time for what I know about Sydney. I was a sales manager and I was giving people great uh, expectations of Sydney in the 1980s because they sort of said, John, you know Sydney better than anybody else. And then about 10 years ago, I was approached to run some uh, experiences in Sydney. And then about four years ago, I bought a business called Sydney Urban Adventures, which has now transformed into 24 hours in Sydney. And the beauty of 24 hours in Sydney is that it is a highly sought after search term on Google. And we fortunately now have a website called 24 hours in Sydney. Fantastic. It sounds like you're onto a good thing there. And it's not been an easy time for anyone over the last 18 months, especially those in tourism, hospitality, aviation, entertainment and the arts. How did you survive the downturn and what's the strategy moving, moving forward? The, the toughest thing for us was that we needed to stay in business. And the only way we could do that was to cut back and, and cut back to the bare bones. So what we created was a website, and we've been populating that website, renaming tours, giving people a chance to actually get the experience in it from a totally different perspective. We love to help workers with their team building, team bonding, and what we discovered is that when people were walking with us, they were doing the talking amongst themselves. So it's a great opportunity to build rapport 
with your own team as well as potential customers. Oh, great. So you do corporate team building as well as tourists and locals who just want to find out a bit more. Is that correct? Oh. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it, there's a, the chances are is that a lot of people think they know Sydney, but we've got a place in George Street. George Street North, actually, because at one day from the late 1860s, 1870s, Sydney was being paved with wood blocks. And they were finally removed just before the Great Depression. And with the road being paved in woodblocks, there's a, there's a section of the road in George Street North that's still paved in woodblocks. 30,000 people walk past that section every day and they don't even realise it's part of our colourful history. And I mean colourful. We are a fabulous country and Sydney is the greatest city in the world. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I believe I saw on your website that you're accepting bookings right now. What are the regulations regarding vaccination requirements for these outdoor walks, please? And do you have any specials that you'd like to tell us about? Well, the, 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 the concept of our um, COVID-19, we follow the government regulations. So at the present moment, we're requiring people to be double vaccinated because as we visit different venues, they're expecting the patrons to be double vaccinated. So we're doing the same thing. So we've got our own uh, in South Wales app uh, that you scan and you register and you come in and bingo, you're in the system. Unfortunately, our app does not allow you to get a blanket entry into venues. You'll need to re uh, enter each time we go in and out of the venue. Now, some of the specials that we have is that we've formed a partnership with a travel partner who is able to offer people who are just thinking of coming to Sydney. All they need to do is to contact us via email uh, or on our social media pages to say, hey, how can, how can we take advantage of your four day, three night stay off on entry from 24 hours in Sydney? Oh, we're right. desperate, we are desperate to get people back into the city. Each mm. time New South Wales has relaxed their, their, uh, their, uh, their, their laws as far as the COVID-19 is concerned, what we created was is that people um, would go into the regional areas and not into the city. We desperately want people back in the city. We want people back in the offices. We want people back in all of the small businesses that drive and serving all of those people in the city of Scotland. And finally, we have new laws, 70% tax rate, yes, 80% tax rate, and soon to be 90% tax rate. We're accepting visitors again from overseas, which is just fabulous news for our industry. Well, yes, the seagulls and the ibises are getting a bit lonely. <laughs> So we do need some people in the city. <laughs> yeah, well, that, this, uh, the seagulls are one thing, but the ibises are actually called bin chickens. <laughs> Very true. Yep. Um, so you've got your walks starting up pretty soon. Are they operational at the moment? And I think you mentioned a special offer where children can come along for free. Is, when does that start? Well, that, that's that been part of our feature on all of our tours that are um, not 18 and over restrictions so how it works is that for each free adult that pays to be on one of our tours they can bring one of their children for free we're not a babysitting service what we are however is that we are offering these uh this incentives to get kids to get to know about sydney we just love it so much we want to share it with as many people as we possibly can well, I had a quick uh, look over your website and I was blown away. There's just so much information there and stuff I didn't know. It's very exciting. So hopefully people will check it out, 24hoursinsydney.com.au and, and come along to one of those walks. So, John, how do you source these amazing locations? Do you do all the sleuthing yourself? Um, as I mentioned, your website is very interesting. It's got a lot of hidden, iconic Australiana there. Um, could you tell us a bit about how you do source these wonderful locations? One of the key factors is that the people who work with us, some uh, we've got one guy who goes all, 
traces his ancestry all the way back to the second fleet. Another one who traces his ancestry back to the first fleet. I myself was a first generation Australian, born after the Second World War, and my parents came here as part of the Displaced Persons Act to populate Australia. And how lucky was I that they desperately wanted to have transportation to the US today, and thankfully they came to Sydney. The and Emerald I've City. Grown up in Sydney, and, and I have done all the crazy things that a city boy uh, would do as a teenager. One of our uh, experiences covers the rock area. We're in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. It was probably uh, one of the dang most dangerous areas to visit in Sydney. Today it's a, a very effective centre. But we take people into one of the bars where uh, Mr. Sin, Abe Salcon, used to have a photographer to take compromising pictures of the influential politicians, lawyers and policemen that sort of began any certain favours if anything ever went wrong with these discussions. Well, yes, that would definitely act as good collateral. Um, and you offer corporate packages, and we've touched on a little bit, as well as walks for tourists and locals who want to discover more about the beautiful Emerald City. What sets 24 Hours in Sydney's offerings apart from the other walking tours and businesses around? Well, we, we, we actually came up with, during the COVID lockdown. We did a lot of thinking. We discovered that when we take bookings from online travel agents, we would have to have inclusions of a BSA for ten dollars, and the customer would need to pay sixteen dollars for that. So we've excluded inclusions from all of our tour offerings because we'd like to save money for our clientele. The, the second aspect that we do is that a lot of other of our competitors, when they charge you, they charge you a per person rate. We put you into groups. And the more, the bigger the group, the cheaper the per person rate becomes. So you might find that someone, one of our competitors will be charging 60 or 30 dollars per person. Our group can come down to as little as 31 dollars per person. Depending on how many people book into the tour. We've even created a Facebook page so that people can put up and say to, say to each other and say, oh, look, I'm thinking of coming to Sydney on the 25th of February. I'm thinking of doing uh, um, the, the rock Thunderbox tour. Um, would you like to join us so we can all save money? And that's all available on our website and also on our Facebook groups. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for your information and making time for the show today. We have to start wrapping up. Was there anything you'd like to share with the viewers before we close the discussion? Well, the, the only thing that I, I can sort of say to you is that Sydney has the most fabulous waterway. And I had a person who came, uh, an employee, if I'm allowed to mention, or a Google employee. Google has a, an office down in uh, Ultimo Glebe. And, and he said to me, how do I get to it? And I said, where are you staying? And he said, here's Circular Sea. I said, well, why don't you just stop study? We have the most fabulous transport system here in Australia. And when I was growing up, we had to tend to the correct fare. But now we have an Opal card that makes it very, very easy for people to travel around Sydney and, and they can actually use Google for their travel papers. And, and I'll, the final thing I want to sort of say is that when you come and you have an experience with us, you end up with a friend in Sydney that can help you at any time in the future. And if you've got other friends who have come to Sydney, you can refer them directly to us Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your adventure, I mean, passion, beg your pardon, for the adventures <laughs> that you put on. Really do appreciate your time today and best of luck moving forward as Sydney reopens. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Sage. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, John. And if you've just joined us, we just had a very interesting discussion with Sir John Pastor, the General Manager of 24 Hours in Sydney. Please do check out the full interview at YouTube on Kalkine Media's channel. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. 
At Kalkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge-watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no-buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. In this Expert Talk, I'll be shining a light on Zigtool, a digital platform that empowers organizations to unlock collective intelligence, agility and collaboration through a suite of products. Sandeep Gupta is the CEO and founder at Zigtool. He has a vision of evolving the workforce with a unique model of outcome-oriented engagements. And he joins me now live on Cowkind to talk through the finer points of Zigtool. Sandeep, great to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Well, let's start off with the basic approach. For those who aren't familiar with Zigtool, what exactly is it that you do? So Zigtool is actually allowing the organization to unlock the, uh, unlock the collective intelligence. Uh, we strongly believe and the, the organizations have a number of capabilities within the organization and they have to nurture those uh, cap capabilities and talent so that they can innovate the business and grow the business. Yeah, wonderful. It sounds like you're getting uh, very heavily invested in that space and ensuring that there are maximum outputs and outcomes for your clients, which is always what we love to see. Now, Sandeep, in your opinion, what would you say the optimum ways that an employer can nurture their workforce to achieve ultimate cohesion and output are? Okay, if I, if I take it in a very simplistic way, uh, keeping the employee at the center of the strategy for the organization, uh, the one side we have the employee, the other side of the organization goal. So if you look from the employee perspective, what are the aspirations they have? Uh, in a most simplistic view for this is they need a career growth, they need to be recognized and rewarded, they need to be continuously up skill and have the opportunity. And the most important is specifically in the today's time, they should have the ability to build their personal brand. If we cover these four perspectives for the employee aspiration perspective, they will be nurtured and growing. But on the other side, if you see the organization, what are they looking for? They want the employee engagement. They mm. want the upskilling. They want the fostering the innovation in the organization. And at the same time, uh, they want to retain the talent in the company. So the key thing is here, if we can integrate the employee aspiration and the organization objective together, that will be the game changer. And that's where we are talking in the digital, how to bridge that gap and how to grow, let the employee grow. And at the same time, business is growing rapidly and going through the various situations which we are encountering now, we are ready to transform and have the agility in the business. Well, Sandeep, you mentioned game changer in your response just then. One thing that has been a game changer for everybody over the past two years has been COVID. Now, we've seen massive shifts in how people are having to conduct their work. Most recently, of course, that shift has been to remote working. How do you think businesses can future-proof their workplace structure to meet any challenges, whether it be COVID or otherwise, that might emerge in the future? Yeah, thank you. Very valid question. So, if you see the the... The new trend of the business specifically post COVID, it's the hybrid workforce. And where mm -hmm. we are looking at remote and, and, and uh, semi-remote where people are actually working from home or the remote location plus in the office. So how to nurture and one of the challenges introduced with this model is the engagement. If people are not connected with each other, they do not have an opportunity to know each other. It's very difficult for the business to thrive 
and employees to be engaged. And as a result, if the employees are not engaged, the retaining the employee is very difficult. And you see that the mass wave of the employee attrition is coming and lots of things in the news. And that is one of the outcome or the impact of it. So, so if the organizations are able to engage the people in the, for the right outcome and allowing them to perform, not limiting to their roles and responsibility, but going beyond and mm -hmm. connecting with the people and delivering the right outcome and also in the process of learning uh, for themselves and delivering the value for other people, uh, that will be the, actually the game changer. That's what I'm referring to. Yeah, look, motivation is obviously at the core of getting the most out of any employee and having that sense of engagement is a big way to do that. One thing that's come out this week is I think news.com and a few other outlets have been reporting that there's a huge change on the way of uh, millions of Aussies potentially leaving their jobs due to similar issues around engagement, just feeling like they've been a bit burnt out from the whole COVID experience over the past two years. In your opinion, is there something that uh, employers can do to potentially stave off this mass exodus of employees that could be coming? Yes. So if we go to the basics, uh, ultimately everyone has to earn uh, and they have to live. So they need a job. So even mm. the people are, we are talking the mass uh, address on this and that people have to find the job. So what it is changing the behavior now of the employers and the employees. The first thing the employees are looking for the flexibility to work and they want to, to steer their career, the direction where they love, they enjoy more and they are happily managing their personal life as well. So that is introducing the level of talent agility we need in the organization. And at the same time, from the organization perspective, uh, to retain these employees, they need to provide the new opportunities so that the employees are engaged, not limiting to the work, what they have to do, but they can also nurture the talent they have, the nat other natural talent or the skills they are having, how to expose within the organization and at the same time, uh, by exposing, they build the brand and the network. And that's where mm -hmm. the true collaboration and engagement gets established and nurtured in the organization. Well, I think that works quite well in for my next question for you. How can we achieve sustainable long-term success? And for any company, how can they achieve that longevity of being able to continue to function years upon years? So if we talk about longevity, uh, what does it mean? It has the three components. Uh, the employees who are actually in the middle age and they are performing to the best. The senior people who are leading the organizations and have they have the limited time to go forward because they have profound experience, but at the same time, uh, that generation is aging. The third one is the millennial who are coming in the game. So we have to integrate them very well together. I'll give one example to you. If you take an example of the, just think about a staircase. I'm standing on the staircase. I need to look forward. Even I have 20 year experience, 25 year experience, doesn't matter, or 10 year experience. I need to see what is next for me. And that is the key question each and everyone is having in the organization. We mm -hmm. are talking about future of work and the new skills, up skilling. But what does it mean and where do I need to go? Because I have my own aspiration. The organization has the um, some strategy around it and at the same time i have my own uh, capabilities as well which i want to nurture further yep. so putting that all together and defining what are the potential destinations for me to go for it's an area where i'm working or there is some other potential which also makes me relevant for the market down the line now through this process i connect with the people who have gone through the journey and who are uh, who can act as a mentor with me and provide me the insight and also the potential destinations which I can select with. Now, uh, the mentors are good to provide a good insight of the potential destination, but they are not always the best people to take me there. And that is where the another dimension has to be open that I should be able to connect with the right expert, the subject matter expert who can take me to those destinations. And those destinations may, may require a number of uh, number of mode of the transport, which is a, a simple word. Now, uh, I have connected with the mentors and experts to get to my destination and define my des destination. Mm. But the true engagement from the longevity perspective comes if on the staircase, as I am connecting with the people uh, who are ahead from me on the game, if I op start offering myself who are with the people who are behind me on the staircase. And that's where it is two-way process. 
I am the learner and the teacher. When I am learning from the other, I am offering my capability, my capacity to the other. And that is, uh, as a result, organization will thrive with the true collaboration and engagement. And uh, uh, the people will be engaging for the outcome which they have to achieve. Sandeep, that's very insightful. I think uh, it's a very good point that you always need to be looking to learn no matter how successful you've been. If you look at someone like Richard Branson, for example, I mean, his autobiographies, they sell like absolute hotcakes anytime he releases one. People can't wait to see the new insight. Even if they have already thought that they've heard the entire story, there's always another thing they could learn from someone so successful. And I think you're 100% spot on there with picking the right people to, to act as mentors and having this constant forward thinking approach is a really helpful way to help grow the business. Well, Sandeep, as well as that, what would you say, given that Zigtool provides uh, quite a unique service in this sense, who would you rather competitors be and what do you think their limitations are compared to that of Zigtool? So, so Jigtel, the first thing is that uh, it is offering a very unique four-dimensional model, uh, mm. which uh, allows the employee and the organization to thrive. Uh, a four-dimensional model that I can be a learner and I can be a teacher. And the uh, second thing, it also allows me to build my personal brand, and which is very instrumental and critical in today's time, where people are leaving, people are joining. I do not know who is who. I do not have opportunity to meet with the people in person and if I do not carry my personal brand uh, in the company, it's very difficult for me to be remain connected with the company and also for the organization to retain the talent. Yeah. So we are actually focusing it's very uh, intense, intense, intensively on the employee personal brand uh, so that they have the ability to offer themselves and demonstrate their leadership. Mm -hmm. That is one of the key aspects behind it. And if that has been taken care, the in, uh, people will be highly motivated and encouraged uh, to be engaged and collaborated. And at the same time, people will start thinking how to innovate to further enhance their branding, their business they are working on, and what kind of support model is available in the organization, which helps them to convert their idea into the innovation. If you see the McKinsey, a definition what is innovation innovation is how to execute the idea and take it to something which is meaningful uh, for the uh, for achieving the right outcome you mentioned ideas and innovation there. There's certainly been a lot of that going on for the last sort of five years, and in particular that seems to have sped up during the pandemic period. Which technological advancements have caught your eye in the past few months, and are there any emerging trends? Yeah, so in the HR tech, if you see the artificial intelligence, machine learning, HR analytics, it, uh, it, it's uh, pretty much uh, uh, taking, uh, going, very, going at the advanced level. And mm -hmm. uh, what actually the organization and employee are looking out of it, uh, the first thing the organization needs the faster decision making and identify the patterns and behavior of the culture and the people. But that helps them to define the right strategy, develop the right strategy and execute the right strategy to ensure that they retain the talent, they develop the talent, and they uh, deliver the right outcome for their customer. But for the employees also, they need the uh, uh, right level of capability to leverage these technologies to deliver their work better. And also getting the information in a form which can be, uh, can be helping them to deliver their day-to-day -day work. Sandeep, just before we wrap up, it's been really insightful hearing from you today. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our viewers? Uh, so I think the talent agility and the organization agility is at the core of the business now. And uh, and, and if we see in the coming coming future and very soon, uh, as I'm speaking to a number of global organizations, they're not limiting their talent focus within the company. They're talking about crowdsourcing. How can have their second line of uh, uh, employment, what we say, that where people can be engaged as needed and they do not want that all the all the talent or the future of work when they are talking to be hired in the company as a permanent, how can these people be engaged and disengaged as per the requirement. And that is going to change the dynamics of the market and the employment in the, uh, in the coming future. Yeah, wonderful. Now look, just before I let you go, where can we find Zigtool? What's the website and what's the social media channels? Yes, it's uh, www.jigtel.com and uh, you can find us on the LinkedIn as well and, and follow us.
uh, there are number of posts we are sharing how can the organization can thrive and retain their employee which is very important when we are talking employee it's about talent and the capability to deliver the right outcome and, and grow there look that is a hundred percent necessary follow you'll be added to my linkedin that's for sure sandeep thanks so much for your time thank you well, that's Sandeep Gupta, the CEO and founder of Zigtool. And if you missed any part of that interview, you can catch the whole thing shortly on our YouTube channel, Kaokai Media. That's all for now. I'm James Preston reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kaokai. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hi there, I'm Rose Jacobs here with you for Calkine Media. Penny stocks are not only cheap, costing less than $5 a piece Canadian, but also help you enter the stock market universe with smaller investments if you are a new investor. However, due to their smaller market cap, penny stocks also tend to be riskier and more volatile than others. Before we get underway, make sure you do press that bell icon at the bottom of your screen for all the hottest updates. All right, getting stuck into it, here is everything a Canadian investor must know before adding penny stocks to their investment portfolio. Penny stocks offer some fundamental advantages over other stocks. They can come in handy for investors looking to spend little cash. The amount you may spend on a handful of expensive stocks can buy you a lot more in penny stocks. Since the investment is generally smaller in penny stocks, your risk level is also smaller. For example, say you have Canadian $10 to spare and you're putting it in penny stocks. In the case of profit gained, you may make some money, but in case of a loss, you'll only be losing $10. Penny stocks are also often preferred by investors looking for short-term gains. However, there are some cons of investing in penny stocks also. In an effort to get their business off the ground, penny stock companies are also often known to take up significant debt and risks. Therefore, when you invest in a penny stock, you essentially take a share of this risk and bet on the chances that the company will succeed. Penny cap companies are generally not fast growing businesses. So investors can lose their entire investment in penny stocks if the company goes bankrupt. Since investments in penny stocks are small, the gain is also comparatively small. Therefore, to make significant gains in penny stocks, you'll have to invest in higher levels, which in turn will increase your chances of loss as well. So how do you trade penny stocks in Canada? A majority of penny stocks can be found across energy, mining, tech, cannabis and pharmaceutical markets. While not many penny cap companies make it to the Toronto Stock Exchange or TSX, a bunch of them can be found on the junior platform Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV latest videos by Kalkine. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Today we're going to take a look at what is Spell Crypto? Is it worth your attention? Stay with us till the end. Abracadabra.money is another meme-based cryptocurrency that allows users to borrow stable coins called Borrow Magic Internet Money or MIM with interest-bearing assets such as YV, YFI, Xsushi, etc. maintaining the value of US $1. Powered by a multi-blockchain protocol, the abracadabra.money is governed by its native token, Spell, which is used as an assets collateral to mint MIM. As the IBTKNS network backs it, the collateral value keeps on increasing. The Spell token caught the attention of the investors on the 16th of December following the US Senate Sherrod Brown mention of the token in his address at the Federal Open Market Committee meeting. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos from Kalkine. Today we're going to take a look at what prompted Melania Trump to unveil her NFT. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. The NFT market space is buzzing with a new launch, Melania's vision, and no prizes for guessing the person behind the launch. She's none other than Melania Trump, the former First Lady of the United States. Mrs. Trump has become the latest high-profile figure to join the crypto boom when Thursday she announced her own non-fungible token platform, powered by Parlay. Here's a bit more about Melania's NFT. The new non-fungible token, or NFT, features a pair of steely blue eyes, seemingly that of the former First Lady, and is based on a watercolour by famous French artist Marc-Antoine Coulomb. It is a unique artwork of cobalt blue eyes that offers the collectors of this NFT an amulet to inspire, cites the announcement. And the former First Lady's NFT would be released on a regular basis, and the first one can be purchased till the end of the year. So where would the proceeds go? A certain portion from the sale, proceeds of these NFTs, would be donated to support children ageing out of the foster care system. Such children would be provided with adequate computer science skills like programming and software development to assist in their economic empowerment. However, the further announcements would reveal where the rest of the earnings would go. So which network supports Melania's vision? The limited edition piece of the digital artwork of the First Lady would be sold on the Solana blockchain, which is known for lower fees in the NFT space. And 
the ZNFT can be bought for one Solana or about 180 US dollars. As per the press release, more NFTs would be launched at frequent time gaps. The former First Lady is not the only famous personality to embrace the hot digital collectible trend. There's a long list of celebs offering lucrative digital memorabilia like renowned Jamaican athlete Usain Bolt, Argentinian footballer Lionel Messi and American football player Tom Brady. Even Jack Dorsey, the former Twitter CEO, sold the digital version of his first tweet, which fetched over 2.9 million US dollars in March this year. Singers like Justin Bieber and BTS, a well-known K-pop group, have jumped on the NFT bandwagon as well. So the NFT craze refuses to die down as more and more public figures want to tap into the latest frenzy around such assets. And if you like this information, please let us know by liking, sharing and commenting on the video below. Subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon to be notified whenever Calpine releases a video. For more articles like this and regular updates, there is a website. Please have a look, calkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. A very good morning to you and welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Calkine TV Sydney Studios. Now, the Australian share market is set to open higher this morning. ASX futures were up 28 points, or 0.4%, to 7,299. The S&P ASX 200 advanced 0.1%, or 9.8 points, to 7,364.8 yesterday. And that's thanks largely to a bumper session by tech stocks. At the closing bell yesterday, the S&P SX200 was 0.1% or 10 points higher at 7,365. Across the sectors, 5 out of 11 closed in the red. Technology was the best performer, followed by healthcare. Meanwhile, real estate dragged the most, with materials weighing behind that. The best performing stock yesterday was Link Administration Holdings. Their shares closed 15% higher at $5.51. The worst performing stock in the S&P SX200 was Falcon metals closing 37 percent lower at 32 cents moving on to some company news from today the foreign investment review board has no objections to the proposed 23.6 billion dollar acquisition of sydney airport and that's by a consortium led by ifm investors the Sydney Airport Board unanimously recommends that shareholders vote in favour of the deal at a meeting to be held on the 3rd of February next year. Syra Resources has executed an offtake agreement with Tesla to supply natural graphite active anode material from its facility in Vidalia in USA. Tesla also has an option to offtake additional volume from Vidalia subject to Syra expanding its capacity. Cyrus' flagship is the Balamo Graphite operation in Mozambique, but also the downstream active anode material facility in the U.S. Cyrus' vision is to be the world's leading supplier of superior quality graphite and anode material products. And Collins Foods has appointed Mark Hawthorne as a new independent non-executive director of the company. Most recently, he was CEO and executive director of Guzman and Gomez from 2015 to 2020. Before that, he led McDonald's in various markets, including Britain, New Zealand, the Middle East and Africa over a period of 10 years. And Genix Power has entered into a binding bi-directional service provider connection and access agreement with PowerLink Queensland for the Boulder Coombe battery project located in central Queensland. Genix has a portfolio of more than $1 billion of renewable energy generation and storage projects across Australia. Well, now it's time for a short break. Stay tuned for more news set to affect the trading day. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV.
Welcome back to the Morning Outlook Report. Let's take a close look at overnight trade on Wall Street. The Dow Jones rose 0.4 percent. The S&P 500 is up 0.7 percent and the Nasdaq rose 0.8 percent. Now U.S. stocks did advance yesterday and that's amid the release of mostly positive economic data. Consumer confidence rose more than forecast for December and the conference board's index increasing 115.8 from November's 111.9. Also over in the US, existing home sales gained less than expected but still advanced 1.9% to an annualized 6.46 million. Over in Europe, the stocks 50 index was up 0.8%. The FTSE in London was up 0.4% and the DAX up 0.8%. Oil is up 21% at $75.54 a barrel and gold is up to 1805 US dollars that's up 0.9% and iron ore is up oh, sorry iron ore did fall that's down 2% to 121 dollars and 40 cents well that's all for our morning outlook report here on calcine tv have a great day trading stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day this is rachel signing off for now Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Thanks for tuning in, Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. The world of social media is diversifying and expanding every minute, with billions of users actively consuming content, buying, selling and shaping their lifestyle in accordance with it. So with that, let's zoom into five social media trends to watch out for in 2022. First of all, short video content will rule. Short attention spans, busy schedules and an irresistible urge to scroll has led users to now consume more short-form content widely. Platforms like TikTok, YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, Instagram Stories and Twitter Moments have been widely loved in the past one year. It's expected that they'll continue their rule in the upcoming year as well. Secondly, Influencer Marketing Frenzy. It's safe to say that social media influencers are very capable of influencing various lifestyle choices of the common people. In fact, according to a report by the Digital Marketing Institute, 49% of consumers depend on the recommendations made by influencers. And with the industry all set to reach $13.8 billion soon, influencer marketing will certainly continue to grow in the upcoming year. Number three, social media, the new shopping hub. Online shopping has reached an all-time high with the onset of the pandemic. And younger generations across the globe are using social media sites like Instagram, Facebook and Pinterest to buy trendy products. So it's highly likely that this trend will continue to rule in 2022 as well. Coming in at number 4, the augmented reality buzz. With Metaverse gaining a lot of prominence these days, social media is expected to undergo a reshaping with AR. With Facebook taking a step ahead in creating the buzz, other social media platforms like Snapchat are also expected to continue with it in the upcoming year. And lastly, social media accountability. With news echoing around the world about the negative influence of social media, sites like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat and Public are highly likely to demand accountability from these social media networks. The content that goes around will be scrutinized enough along with the strategic choices of marketers. So 2022 will certainly witness a change in the content flow of these sites. Now to check the speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. This has been Hall Shields for Carbon Media.
Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Very good afternoon and welcome to Expert Talks. I'm Rose Jacobs, your host for the show. Now this is the show that brings experts and industry leaders right to your screen so that you can profit in your own financial world and be inspired by some of the experts and leaders. Today we're speaking with Michael Rayner Jansen, Managing Director of Power Technology Engineered Solutions. Michael, it's a very good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Hello, Rose. Uh, thanks for inviting me to the show. <laughs> a pleasure. Now, just before we get started, I'd like to cover exactly what your company is all about. Power Technology Engineered Solutions, or Power Tech, is, from my understanding, an Australian independent family-owned energy technology company and system integrator. And sounds like you have a very highly motivated and experienced team with technical core competencies in things like distributed energy, battery energy storage, power systems engineering, and system integration engineering. Have I covered everything? <laughs> that was quite a multiple, yes, uh, all, <laughs> all these times. But um, yes, you're correct. Um, yeah, we basically work with utilities and we work with communities um, and, and uh, industry to power their sites or their network more sustainably and uh, more reliably and more independently. So yes, uh, to say a bit simpler, um, that's it. Thank you. So to start with, can you tell us about how microgrid and distributed energy systems and solutions benefit the power supply systems? Yeah, yes. Um, microgrids are playing an increasingly important role in power grids. Yeah. You know how the energy sector, everybody says that, is transitioning from um, central generation, uh, which was one way from the power station to the consumer, to a bidirectional network that uh, that allows for lots of small distributed um, solar, um, wind, renewable generation in general. And um, that has a bidirectional power flow through the network. So microgrid technology uh, delivers kind of um, what I call autonomous cells within this future network. So where a commercial, a commercial or industrial operation or a community indeed uh, can uh, not only power itself more sustainable with their own renewables, but also more independently from the power network. That means uh, they can access uh, the energy wholesale markets, which reduces their, their energy bill. Um, and at the same time, however, can make the network more resilient uh, to avoid overload and congestion in a future network that is more democratic and that allows for more exchange. It's uh, quite a diversification by the sounds of it there. So in your opinion, how sustainable is Australia's power system at the moment? Yeah, on, on, on the high level, 
Um, if I remember well, Australia sits at 25% electricity generation from renewables, so, so that number sits somewhere in the middle as compared to other nations with comparable socioeconomic status. But of course, Australia has all this uh, renewable uh, resource, the sun, and can and must do more and become more sustainable and become more of a leader. And, and we all uh, know that, um, well, there are political factors that have slowed down that development. Um, but there are also um, systemic factors. Australia has a very complicated regulatory framework, uh, both for, for, for the energy markets and for, for the energy networks. And those must develop. Um, we, we have seen, as PowerTech, we, we've done community networks, we've obviously worked through those issues, and we have seen uh, issues uh, with, with our projects where basically a network said, no, you can't have a private electron on a public network, and uh, similar operational issues. So um, these things make simple developments difficult, and as a small Business PowerTech uh, has the opportunity to work through those and contribute uh, to resolve those regulatory developments uh, with pilot projects. Sounds certainly quite complex. So, how have PowerTech's capabilities been demonstrated in transformative energy applications? So, luckily, we we did have the opportunity uh, working with customers um, to. I think we have eleven microgrids with battery energy storage systems on the Australian distribution network, and yes, they're all ticking away. They're they're, they're all working. We started uh, with a project in Cape Jervis in South Australia, uh, which which is a, a town microgrid, and part of that town can go off grid. Um, we received the Clean Energy Innovation Award from the Clean Energy Council in 2016 for uh, Community Mural Park in, uh, in the eastern end of Melbourne, um, where we also have a renewable microgrid that can operate off-grid, and it sometimes goes uh, off-grid for 24 hours. We've done three charging stations uh, with uh, Australian charging network uh, ChargeFox, and um, we do tricks there, and that, that sounds uh, quite amazing. I think uh, we have high high powered EVs charging like two modern EVs with two hundred with three hundred fifty kilowatts on a petrol station, which is only connected to a feeder that can do hundred kilowatts. So all that is complemented quickly by the battery while keeping the technology parameters in uh, in balance. Um, Quite funny also, we've, we've done uh, two pole-mounted uh, batteries for United Energy that duct the kilowatt koalas because they wrap around the pole. We've done an industrial microgrid for a jump factory in Handoff, South Australia, and the next one is for the Guinean Dairy community in the ACT. So thanks, uh, <laughs> we've got quite, uh, quite an opportunity to, to prove these concepts. A very busy schedule indeed. So oh, Michael, yeah, recently, as you mentioned, PowerTech has delivered these first fleets of EV charging station batteries for the public, the electric vehicle charging net network with ChargeFox. So can you elaborate a little more on that and give us your expert opinion on how EVs will transform Australia's energy consumption patterns? Yeah, so, so um, of course the, the models predict, and that's quite natural, that uh, there's more uh, demand, um, but EVs will also equalize the demand because EVs charge every day, also in the middle of the day when we have a lot of solar. But I think the key question is uh, is how to deal with those uh, spikes that uh, electro vehicle charging causes on the electricity network. And uh, this is becoming very relevant uh, with increasing uptake in Australia. Australia is still uh, on a low level, but now we have lots of new projects, including uh, public bus fleets becoming electrical. And the I think the solution there is not building conventional networks, means building new large substation, um, but often the more economical and sustainable uh, approach to deal with those uh, spiky uh, demands, spiky loads, is indeed uh, batteries and microgrid controls. And it's not only about economical, that's even more economical, but of course also about uh, sustainability. And um, the network that we work with, the charging network ChargeFox, for example, uh, aim at being 100% renewable when charging electrical cars, and and to do that, our technology also helps to generate uh, solar on site or to feed in that solar power at one end of the network and use it at another at the other end of the network in the given regulatory network and market, which has its complexities. Some very exciting new directions yet to come. I'll be watching that very closely. Now, final question. 
innovation is really the key to success for any organisation in the present world. So can you tell us about the recent innovation strategies you've implemented in your grid battery energy storage and other products? Yeah, as a, as a smaller company bootstrapping ourselves only on the market since 2014 and so, so, so we didn't take an approach like how do we become the next unicorn. We rather uh, took a, an approach of, of uh, uh, get the uh, innovation really from customer pressures. So we work very closely with the network, with, with the industry, with the charging networks and have the opportunity that within pilot projects um, we we actually uh, we feel the pain and we make them work we make them work in this environment so so we do end-to-end -end solutions which is a lot of work for a small company but which gives us the freedom to do innovation and yes we obviously do it a bit smart and sophisticated and we work and grow together with our customers i think that summarizes the innovation strategy best it's a, it's a wonderful plan and strategy, I can, I can assure you. But Michael, that's all we've got time for, for today. I thank you so much for joining us here on Expert Talks. Thank you for having me, Rose. Thanks for Pleasure. the opportunity. Michael Rayner Jansen, Managing Director of Power Technology Engineered Solutions. And that's it for today's talk. I'm Rose Jacobs, and I'll see you next time on Calkine TV. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine. Hi there, I'm Rose Jacobs here with you for Calkine Media. One thing automakers have found impossible to ignore is the seemingly impending electrification of the transport system. To this end, lithium is worth its weight in gold, figuratively speaking. Canada sits on massive deposits of lithium. But before we dig deeper into this topic, make sure you hit the bell icon at the bottom of your screen for all the hottest updates. Here we go, lithium has been given monikers such as white petroleum or the new gasoline. And Canada has thought to hold about 4% of the world's lithium. So let's take a look at Canada's lithium market and prospects. Here are Canada's EV battery developments in 2021. In January of this year, the National Research Council of Canada identified lithium mining as an emerging market opportunity as it sought to expand the country's battery manufacturing capabilities. And looking back, it certainly seems the effort was met with encouragement. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and US President Joe Biden met in February this year and pledged to create a supply chain on the continent for electric vehicle or EV batteries. Lithium, like all alkali metals, is highly combustible and its transportation over vast distances are not encouraged in the industry. In March, it was reported that the US was looking at helping battery manufacturers expand into Canada in a bid to counter Chinese competition. In early November, Tesla opened a factory to produce battery making equipment. Given the need for energy security, the US Department of Commerce stressed the need for a regional supply chain like Asia has and Europe is in the process of accomplishing. Tesla were among several companies who were present at the March meeting. So what are the prospects for Canada's lithium market? Canada's enviable amount of lithium is locked in the Canada Shield. 
That's a vast region of Precambrian igneous and metamorphic rock shield. Some experts say that the geological nature of the shield does not make for easy mining. However, as the National Research Council of Canada has pointed out, the nation is very accomplished when it comes to mining. The International Energy Agency, or IEA, estimates that from 4 million electric vehicles in 2018, the world will have 120 million electrical vehicles in 2030. Canada, with a global reputation for commitment to a low carbon economy and a relatively stable market, plus expertise in sustainable development, is poised to grab a huge piece of the electric vehicle manufacturing pie. Its lithium battery manufacturing abilities made a few leaps and bounds this year, but next year could see this really accelerate. And that's a wrap for now, but please check out the website for more, calkinemedia.com.au, and make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Rose Jacobs, thanks for joining me. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Ali Zoabi, APAG Director for Arctic Intelligence. Now, Arctic Intelligence is a regulatory technology company, otherwise known as a regtech, that transforms financial crime risk assessments to help protect businesses. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners and market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you to understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. So welcome to the show today, Ali. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks for having me. Great to speak with you today. Now, Arctic Intelligence offers a wide range of services. Would you like to introduce Arctic's offerings to our audience? Sure, thank you. So Arctic Intelligence is a RegTech, uh, so a regulatory technology provider. Uh, everyone's heard of fintechs. Uh, fintechs are doing a great job in disrupting the banking industry. Uh, RegTechs uh, similarly are helping businesses meet their regulatory obligations via software solutions. And so Arctic Intelligence uh, is Australia's RegTech of the year um, and one of the world's leading RegTechs. Uh, we help businesses predominantly move from a spreadsheet-based um, uh, compliance program to a software solution where they can conduct financial crime risk assessments using the efficiency and effectiveness of a software solution, whether that is across anti-money laundering, anti-bribery and corruption, fraud, modern slavery, human trafficking, wildlife trafficking, climate change, uh, and other um, uh, financial crime and ESG considerations. Excellent. Now, you mentioned ESG there. Why is environmental, social and governance important to help in identifying and helping to combat financial crime? Well, thanks. Great question. So, it, environmental and social governance is a very hot topic at the moment. Probably couldn't get much hotter. Uh, particularly with the upcoming uh, global conference uh, on climate change. But there's a convergence, a real convergence of issues that are combining to create a real impetus around an issue that already had strong momentum being ESG. So ESG probably started, arguably started back in the 70s with a, a strong uh, message that the business community sent to uh, South Africa in the divestment um, 
uh, of a range of businesses due to the apartheid regime. And it's really grown since then into uh, anything that um, businesses uh, feel their, their stakeholders value. Um, so a business needs to consider the ESG considerations of all stakeholders, whether they're investors, whether they are employees, whether they are clients, whether they are regulators, uh, or, or the, any broader sort of community that they impact. So a successful business needs to be, uh, needs to have a close understanding of the expectations within the markets they serve and needs to take meaningful actions addressing those considerations if it wants to attract uh, the right clients, the right investors, the right employees, and it wants to keep its regulators happy. So as an example, uh, across climate change, we're seeing, as, as we all see, um, businesses around the world wanting to ensure that they are taking meaningful steps. Excellent. And Ali, do you meaningful think it's more important than ever before to be aware of financial crime prevention and detection? Absolutely. So, um, financial crime, financial crime covers a range of risk domains. So whether it's modern slavery or human trafficking or anti-money laundering or anti-bribery corruption or fraud. And often what we find is that these crimes are interlinked. So for example, um, uh, those criminals or terrorists that are involved in uh, anti-money laundering, they will fund uh, human trafficking and modern slavery using uh, proceeds from, from other crimes. And so it's crucial that a financial institution or a reporting entity uh, is, is very much focused on uh, financial crime risks and looks at them holistically, um, not in isolation, and looks at them at an enterprise level. And how does your company proactively assess and detect these risks? So we help businesses move from a spreadsheet based uh, financial crime risk assessment to a, a software solution. What we find is that there are different levels of maturity around Asia Pacific and around the world. Some businesses uh, are doing some level of financial crime risk assessment using uh, manual means, for example, spreadsheets. Some are doing that already on software solutions. Not, not many are as yet. And some businesses don't quite know where to start. So what we do is we help businesses understand the different risk domains that they need to be aware of and then help them with uh, going through the process of understanding the risks, assessing their controls and, and understanding their residual impact, the residual risk rating in each of those risk domains and then strengthening their controls in order to reduce the likelihood, reduce the consequence uh, and, and strengthen the controls around each of those areas. So what we, what we find around uh, Asia Pacific, for example, is that uh, banks, um, foreign exchange providers, wagering businesses, uh, gold bullion traders, r remitters, generally they, they understand, for example, the need um, to conduct um, risk assessments, particularly around anti-money laundering. So we know that around the world, and Australia or Hong Kong or the UK are no different, very active regulators who are very determined to uh, understand and detect where those businesses are not quite meeting their obligations. And so what we do is we help uh, those uh, regulated entities um, uh, understand where their weaknesses are, uh, assess the risks in each of those risk domains, assess understand and assess the controls around each of those risk areas uh, and then develop a, a residual risk rating and then more importantly understand a, a, an action plan you know, where are we now what do we need to do to get to where we need to be because if a, if an investor as i mentioned earlier an investor a client um uh, a, or a regulator comes knocking that you want to be able to demonstrate through actions that you've taken the right steps to address the right risks and that's how we help businesses um, around the world. There's about 250 clients that use us already, uh, and that's growing sharply. Essentially, what we do is we help them um, have a, an auditable, efficient and effective um, software solution to enterprise level risk assessments around a range of 
environmental and social governance uh, requirements. It sounds absolutely essential. Now, the Financial Action Task Force has been proactively sharing new international recommendations to tackle things like money laundering and terrorist financing. And how do you see the recent developments in the transaction monitoring and screening segment helping the industry? So the Financial Action Task Force came about because the group of seven countries, uh, which we, we were all over the G7, uh, the G7 in uh, 1989, uh, they came together, and one of the one of the items they agreed on was there's there's a global emerging global problem of financial crime, and in particular anti money laundering, but also anti bribery and corruption, also fraud, modern slavery, human trafficking, um, wildlife trafficking, and so the, the Financial Action Task Force was established by the G7, um, and the Financial Action Task Force is often referred to as FATF. Um, the acronym FEDEF, and they're headquartered in Paris, and they um, will regularly um, monitor developments in the, particularly the financial markets, but in any other markets where financial crime uh, is prevalent or could become prevalent, and they will continue to issue guidance as to how regulators should be policing and what regulators should be expecting of the of their regulated entities, which I mentioned earlier on. The deposit takers, banks, foreign exchange providers. So anywhere where a criminal, uh, cr criminal enterprises have existed for, for centuries. And, and the challenge for criminals is, how do they take that dirty money and turn it into clean money? And so the Financial Action Task Force provides guidance to help regulators and businesses detect and prevent uh, that cleansing, that laundering um, process because often that dirty money is then used to fund modern slavery or human trafficking. Um, and, and, and often those businesses may well be uh, highly uh, unlikely to, to comply with um, other ESG considerations such as climate change. So um, so it's crucial to keep on top of, for, for those businesses out there that are regulated, it's important to be aware of the Financial Action Task Force, have a look at the kind of guidance that they are issuing, because chances are, the regulator in your jurisdiction is looking closely at what that F is requiring uh, and is uh, has either already imposed or is likely to soon impose uh, the guidance that that F is issuing. So as an example, just this week in the United States, the Department of Treasury issued guidance about transaction monitoring generally, uh, but also specifically to an emerging market being the cryptocurrencies. And so that's just one example in one jurisdiction you could you could look up um, uh, regulator guidance in every jurisdiction and see a very close correlation between what regulators are doing and what the financial action task force for the g7 construct has has um has expected so as an example um, businesses such as cryptocurrencies need to be aware of transactions that breach the thresholds that regulators generally set in each jurisdiction for example, in Asia Pacific, generally the value is around about that $10,000 US. When a transaction occurs that exceeds that, that value, alarm bells ring or and further investigation is needed. If you're not doing so, chances are you will be identified by criminals uh, as, a, as a softer target. You'll be exploited uh, and it's likely to result in uh, further issues when regulators become aware of, of poor control environment that you have, such as you know issuing of fines, the, the the damage that comes with um, the the publicity associated with having those weak controls. So you need to be aware of of, of the FAT F uh, guidelines. Something very simple that anyone who is interested in in adhering to anti money laundering um, uh, principles, you need to be conducting regular enterprise level risk assessments for AML, AML CTF. And those principles are guided by FATF. For example, assessing your channel risks, assessing your business risks, assessing your customer risks, understanding the geographies and jurisdictions you operate within and the level of risk they present, either through their, their rankings on Transparency International or the United Nations sanctions listings for different individuals and countries. 
that's absolutely crucial. You can't operate in a vacuum. You can't just hope it's not going to impact you. It's not hard to do a quick Google search and see the businesses in your own industry, your own peers in different jurisdictions who have been called out by regulators uh, and have received publicity they may otherwise not have wanted to receive. You want to be on the right side of, of publicity, the right side of history, so to speak. Absolutely. Well, it's such an important space that you're working in. Thank you so much for taking the time to explain it to us. Thank you, Ali. You're most welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, with that, I will sign off, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the Crypto Buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Please subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Today we're covering Voxy's VOXEL Crypto. Is it similar to any tactical RPG game which is powered by the Ethereum blockchain? Let's find out. Sage here for Kalkine Media. And the 3D free-to-play game offers a wide variety of characters, with each of them being represented by Voxies, which are owned as non-fungible tokens or NFTs. In fact, the NFTs have changed the gaming world altogether, especially this year. And due to its unique model, the users enjoy twin benefits of playing the game and getting rewards with cryptocurrency or NFTs. But unlike games such as Axie Infinity, Voxies doesn't need the players to invest in purchasing avatars or have a deep understanding of the crypto world to enter the game. So why is Voxel rising? The market saw tremendous activity following the announcement of a Voxel token sale on Binance Launchpad on Tuesday, 14th December. As soon as Binance announced the token sale, its value rose by 1,000%, moving from 20 cents US to $7 US. The price, however, has corrected since then and has come back down to half its price. The Binance's announcement has, in fact, given the token the much needed push, which was otherwise static in its movements. And one of the features of the Voxel token is that it offers in game marketplaces for players wherein they can trade their NFTs. The gamers can earn rewards by engaging in PvP player versus player or PvE player versus environment mode. And besides that, the gamers can also explore Voxy's universe. So what is Voxel's price prediction? Voxel is ranked 2790th on coin market cap and has a fully diluted market cap of 992 million US dollars with a maximum supply of 300 million Voxel coins. And according to the market experts, with the marriage of NFTs and gaming platforms, games such as Voxel, Axie Infinity are in for a golden run and can be considered a profitable investment option. Now, despite its docile nature, the Binance's listing could kickstart a rally in the coming weeks with with the price reaching its previous all-time high by the end of this year. And experts believe that the token has been attracting the gaming community and in the next five years could grow by 690% and its price could touch 800 US dollars by 2026. So in conclusion, Voxel has the right to economics to grow in the near future. Its first target, however, would be to finish 2021 on a strong note, then consolidate from there. And with some of the unique features and its different approach from other play to earn games, it has managed to create a space for itself as a 3D game and could also inspire similar tokens in the domain. So if you like this information, please like, share, comment on the video below, subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. For more information and regular updates, head to the website calkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Calkine Media.
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. I'm Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Good morning to you and welcome to the Smart Market Insights here on Kalkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs and today we'll be shining some light on how Australia's regional property market fared during the COVID-19 pandemic. Australia's housing price boom has quickly outpaced price rises in any other sector within the country. While it became increasingly difficult to find a house in capital cities like Sydney and Melbourne amid sky-high prices, prices were also seen to be spiralling out of control in regional areas. The rapid shift of workers from cities to regional areas has led to a demand surge in areas such as the Illawarra region, Kiama Heights and Shoalhaven Heads. This amalgamation of varying factors that developed during the pandemic has led to an excessively unaffordable housing market right across Australia. While some correction is slowly seeping into the economy now, it might take a long time before prices simmer down to levels that are palatable for home buyers. So what does the regional property market look like? Apart from regions surrounding main cities, prices have also risen in distant and remote towns across the country. In fact, the pressure was so immense that some of these regional areas recorded the highest growth in value overall. CoreLogic's latest report titled Best of the Best gave some interesting insights into the regional housing boom. As per CoreLogic data, prices of Ocean Grove's units in Geelong rose by 41.7% over the year to November 2021, while Fraser Island units in Wide Bay saw a price rise of 48.2%. Moving closer to main cities, the coastal suburb of Yamba in the far north coast region of New South Wales also saw prices heating up by 56.6%. Meanwhile, the Gerringong region in Illawarra saw property prices soaring by 56.4% through the previous year. Speculations are rife that such immense rises in prices might not arise in 2022 when lending conditions become stricter and affordability becomes a less pressing concern. On the flip side, prices might get adversely hit if the economy is forced to shut down and property listings fall. Of late, the removal of lockdown restrictions has led to a large uptick in the number of auctions, so it is crucial that the virus remains in check and precautions are followed. Work from home arrangements are also pushing regional demand. The pandemic brought unique working arrangements with it in the form of working from home. Recent data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics or the ABS reveals that the work from home population increased by over 40% during the first half of 2021. With the remote working facility prevalent in different parts of the country, individuals have shifted to regional areas searching for better affordability. 
The skyrocketing property prices in the main cities have pushed out many first-time buyers from the market. As such, many are now flocking to regional areas, leading to soaring demand in the regions, and subsequently upward pressure is developing on prices. Additionally, many Australians have sought locations near coastal regions to live out their dream of owning a luxury home near the beach. However, it is worth noting that once offices reopen completely, yet another shock might arise in the housing sector in the form of reduced demand for these regional towns. In the meantime, experts speculate that such a day could be a distant reality owing to the Omicron and Delta variant scares. Well, that's all for now. We will be back again with the exclusive Hot Performers show. Till then, keep watching Calkine TV for the latest market updates and related insights. I'm Rose Jacobs, signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement.